Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. It was summer break in high school in Kansas. A few of my friends and I would go hunting at night. Now I know that that is highly illegal and just plain wrong, but we were young. Weeks passed and it became a regular thing to do on weekends. My parents owned a country home that we only used on a few occasions so we normally went to the surrounding land on our hunts as no one would bother us. Most times. It was anywhere from five to seven of us. Only a few would carry guns while the others carried flashlights. If we got bored we brought our game consoles and played in my country house. Towards the end of the summer most of my friends got tired of it so we had stopped. One day. My best friend asked that we should go. I also decided to bring my cousin who was visiting for the week. So, it was decided that my friend, my cousin, and I would all go hunting that night. It was just like usual. We went on our regular paths in the woods with my cousin holding the flashlight while we held the rifles. We joked about finding a deer so we could eat it. I remember being really hungry. We wandered much deeper into the woods than we usually go in the hopes of finding some big game. It was getting late and we had just decided to turn around to head home. Out of nowhere we heard a loud metal clank sound. It sounded like a hammer hitting a metal sheet. At first I turned to my friend and asked if he had misfired his rifle. He immediately denied it. Then we heard it again. And again. It kept a steady rhythm. About 10 second intervals. We thought it might be a big animal as the noise kept getting louder and louder. Maybe a mountain lion or bear. Who knows it was all too sudden but it sounded like it was getting closer. By this time we were running back to the truck and just trying to get the hell out of there. As soon as we reached the dirt road we hopped into the vehicle and hauled ass back towards town. Once home we calmed down and talked about what had just happened. We unanimously agreed it must have been some animal wandering the woods. The next day while I was watching TV my parents storm into my room and chewed my ass for coming home so late. I remember my cousin and I being baffled because last time I checked, it was midnight. Apparently we got home sometime around 3 a.m. I called my friend up and asked if his parents said anything about coming home so late. He told me that we got home at midnight just like I had previously thought and that I didn't know what I was talking about. We didn't talk about it much after that. It sort of just went away. One day however, when I was actually hunting with my dad and a few of my uncles we stumbled on a circular clearing in the woods. It just looked odd, out of place. My dad just said that it seemed like a deer made clearing and we all shrugged it off. As we continued walking my heart sank as I realized that this was the part of the woods I had heard the sounds at. Again, this was six years ago. My friend and I no longer talk. And I rarely see my cousin. This story sort of fell off my memory until I met up with my cousin and he brought it up. I'm not a huge believer in the supernatural or aliens. That being said I know that this really happened and I have never figured out what truly occurred that night. Little Blue Boy Road. I was traveling the back road surrounding Hutchinson, Kansas one night and my friend had told me the story of Little Boy Blue. Apparently, Little Boy Blue had drowned in a creek off the road. My friend and I drove down this road and I got the sense of something odd and I started crying. When we passed the bridge where Little Boy Blue had died, I felt it. We parked the car and sat for a while. Then the car's lights started flashing blinkers, headlights, taillights, dome lights, inside lights. So we drove on. Then we saw two orbs of light up ahead and we thought it was another car. We never passed another car and there were no turnoffs on the road. I know little boy Blue haunts that road and he is a friendly spirit. A few months ago, two friends and I were going on a road trip from the east coast to the west coast. On Route 70. Friend 1 is driving, we're over halfway through Missouri at around 4 in the morning, 100 miles or so from the western border of the state. I'm awake and friend 2 is asleep. The towns are getting further and further apart. It's dark outside so we can't see very much, but we start noticing that the ground is getting flat, as we are seeing lights from towns that are miles away from us. We weren't expecting the ground to be this flat until we drove a good distance into Kansas. Everything is widely spread out and we're both getting confused so friend one tells me to go to Google Maps on my phone to find our location. The GPS on my phone says that we're still on Route 70 in Missouri, in an urban area, passing by exits and restaurants beside the highway. 
This is obviously incorrect. Friend 1 is unable to give me his phone to check the map because he has an old flip phone. We wake up friend 2 and tell him to check the map on his phone, and he tells us that he's seeing the same thing. Both of our phones start glitching, and they suddenly turn off at the same time. Neither of us can turn them back on. Something is totally wrong, the area is far too rural and we should have already passed through Kansas City. The sky gets a little bit lighter and we notice that there's farmland as far as we can see on both sides of the highway. We stopped in a small town off an exit, with an old inactive train sitting parallel to the highway. Friend 2 takes the battery out of his phone and puts it back in. And he's able to turn it on again. I try to do the same thing but mine won't turn on. We go to maps and find out that we actually aren't in Missouri anymore. We're in Colorado. So at some point in the last 150 miles or so, we crossed the border of Missouri and Colorado. The problem is that this border doesn't exist, Kansas is in between the two states. Which means we entirely skipped Kansas somehow. We stand outside of the car for a minute trying to figure out what the fuck just occurred. Friend 1 says wait, do you hear that? We hear a faint, distant whistling, I recognize the melody. It's Moya by Godspeed You, Black Emperor, which is the last song we were listening to, hours before this whole thing started. Friend 1, Friend 2, and I get the absolute fuck out of there. Went there years ago as a teenager with a couple friends. Cop swooped in immediately, and asked about our business there. It was during the day, at least, so we sort of played it off like we were there to visit a dead relative or something. But, yeah, we were passing though so we stopped. The church that's supposed to be a gateway to hell or whatever was gone, and there was just a foundation. Don't know what's there now. At the very least, it's sort of atmospheric, but we didn't see anything spooky. Just small town hick deputies. I grew up in Kansas, partly on a farm, partly on the outskirts of Topeka. I can say, the farm was definitely spooky, but I imagine most farms kind of are. We came home one night and there were five big piles of shit in the foyer. The doors were still locked, and our dog was still chained up outside. Parents freaked all night over that. Most scared I ever got was in my treehouse as it got dark. Probably not paranormal, but I got terrified something was circling me and wouldn't come down. Also, Kansas isn't as ugly as people say. There's something beautiful and a little unsettling about being able to see for miles in every direction. Me seven years ago. 14-year-old testosterone-filled teenage boy lived in the backwoods of Kansas. Always go camping out there with one of my good friends. Never had any problems besides goats from a nearby farm coming and wrecking the site. We didn't know who exactly owned the land, but we figured no one would come trekking down there just to stop some teenagers from enjoying the outdoors. One day we got sick of the goats messing up our shit so we trekked further inland across a brook and into a clearing. Someone had obviously been there before, and recently, as there was a fire pit that wasn't soggy or old. The creepiest part we noticed was that it smelled like blood. We set up our tent, made a fire in the pit, and started playing on our Game Boys. Daytime passed to twilight, so we cooked up some hot dogs and decided to chill in the tent and talk about random things. The first thing we said was that we had a very strange feeling about the clearing we were in. You could hear what sounded like faint singing in the distance, but no words, just constant moans. We get freaked out badly and start making crosses out of sticks and twine from nearby vines. We plunged them into the ground around our tent, just in case. We had never been that scared before. We both fall asleep scared shitless. I wake up at about 3.30 am and have to piss bad. Don't want to go outside. Still hearing the strange moaning singing. Figure I would piss myself sleeping if I didn't. Walk outside the tent. I see a faint light in the distance. A candle. Our fire is embers at this point. I piss fast and get back into the tent and sit straight up and wait till morning. Three fucking hours of sitting straight up watching. Sun comes up. Friend wakes up from a dream. I tell him about the light I saw. He says someone probably lives nearby. We both get out. We are fucking shocked to see our tent in the middle of a pentagram. Someone turned the crosses we made upside down. We pack our shit and hide ill at the fuck back home. We tell my dad what happened. He gets a very worried look in his eye. Turned out a close friend of his owned the land across the brook. He and the landowner go down there with a rifle later in the evening. I fell asleep. Wake up to my dad entering the house again. He has a fucking bite mark on his arm. Blood everywhere. He takes a shower and bandages up and then gives me the complete story. There has been a cult using that land as their ritual base ever since the 1950s. 
They practice human sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and cannibalism. He and the landowner thought they cleared the land of the cult and scared them off for good about seven years ago. The police are investigating the site the next day. They found about six infant skeletons. Me and my friend could have been eaten alive or sacrificed to some backyard deity. Or even worse, set ablaze in the middle of a pentagram in our tent. That fact has given me a ton of mental problems in my life. Don't know if this fits but it's the lone freak experience I can't explain in my life. I've been trying to figure out if this was a hallucination or an actual experience but I had some weird shit go down hunting in northern Kansas last April. Turkey season. Sitting up against a tree on the edge of a field. Watching the sun rise and letting out a little hen cluck every now and then. Pretty comfy. See movement out of the corner of my eye. Big ass bobcat walking within five feet of me out from the wood line. Walk right past me. Turns between me and my decoy. Sits down. Stares right at me. Think about shooting it but the fur bearer season ends in February here. Hunt is pretty much done if there is a predator in the field but not really upset. Never been this close to a bobcat so I'm pretty happy just to watch him and see if he does anything cool. Have had opossums and deer roll by me like this but they always flee when they bust me. This thing is staring right at me. About a minute goes by. Staring contest. Kind of getting uncomfortable. You need to leave. Bobcat said that not me. I saw its lips move. Sit there like a fucking idiot for another moment trying to figure out what the fuck just happened. Look around to make sure there isn't anyone in the bushes fucking with me. Bobcat is still staring at me. Start to stand up because I'm freaking the fuck out now. Hello? No answer. Bobcat slowly walks into the brush and disappears. Is anyone here? No answer. Freak out. Grab my turkey decoy and run back to my truck. I have no history of mental illness outside of some anxiety and depression when I was a teenager over a decade ago. I take no medications. I had woken up early that morning but had at least six hours of sleep. I had not used any psychedelic in over a decade. I ate a donut and some coffee from a gas station for breakfast. No history of seizures. Nothing else seemed particularly strange. No strange sensations, smells, or visual distortions. Am I crazy? Not in the woods, but I found mountain lion tracks in a remote Kansas grassland. This is a pretty scary situation with a little more context. If you have never been on the tall grass prairie, the parts where humans very rarely go. The grass can grow to be over seven feet high in a single year. These are bunch grasses, so their stems grow in super tightly packed bunches. To give you an idea, I was in the midst of a huge stand of this stuff, and at one point I literally couldn't push forward through the grass. It was a wall, over seven feet, and it was like I was swimming in a sea of this stuff. I could only look up and see the sky. Mountain lions are not supposed to live in Kansas. The government actively tries to hide their existence there, but the locals all know. Everyone has an uncle who has a story of a mountain lion he saw one time. So mountain lions are almost the equivalent of a cryptid in Kansas. So I was doing research for a uni in Kansas one time, by myself, in a dense sea of about seven feet tall grass when I found a tunnel through grass, like something massive had walked through the area and left a trail of flattened grass in its wake. I tried to think of all of the large mammals it could possibly be. Dog. It would have to be bigger than a St. Bernard. Horse. Their body is too high off the ground to do this. Cow. No cows graze this grassland and I'm not aware of any bison either. Then I found a cat print. Bigger than my hand. Only one thing this can be. I nope the fuck out of there as fast as humanly possible. I still wonder if the mountain was watching me. That's possibly my closest brush with death. Be me. Three years ago. Have a huge summer camping trip planned with my best friend. We're both 18, but that didn't stop us from acquiring booze. Leave on a Monday, didn't plan on getting back till the coming Friday. In a deep wooded area of Kansas, about a five hour drive from my town. After about four hours of driving, the only houses are miles apart. Paved road turns to crappy paved road, crappy paved road turns to gravel road, and gravel road turns into dirt road. Land belongs to my grandfather, basically a giant irrigation circle surrounded by forest. The only human life out there is either present during irrigation maintenance or harvesting planting season. We make it there, walk about an hour into the woods carrying big ass heavy backpacks. There's a small clearing in the deep forest we set up camp at. Set up camp, 
Finish at about 7 o'clock. Get a fire going, sit back and crank the stereo. No reception out here so we use an aux cord. We start drinking early. Get drunker and drunker to the point of no motor function by 9 p.m. Slowly crawl my way into the tent and pass out. Friend says he is going to stoke the fire and then join me. Wake up. Something isn't right. I have the vision you get when you get up too fast, and I can't see anything. I feel long grass poking at my back, I'm not in the tent. Try to take some deep breaths to get oxygen back to my eyes. Vision clears, I look up and see the stars and the moon. Look to the side of me, only corn. Start flipping the fuck out. Try to use the phone, it's dead. Start gunning it through this corn field all the way back to a tree line on the other side. I realized I was in the dead center of the irrigation circle. See light in the distance, figure it's the campfire. Start walking towards it. Slowly start to realize this is the opposite side of the irrigation circle. It's not a light on the pump station, because it's whirring in the background about a quarter mile away. Wonder what the fuck this light is. Slowly walk towards it, trying to sneak in the underbrush. As I get closer, I can see it's multiple flickering orbs of light. This ain't swampgas.jpg. I remember reading about glowing orbs, but these seem more natural. As I get closer I can see they are candles. Start flipping the fuck out even more, now paranoid that something. Someone is watching me. Get closer and closer till I see a full circle of candles. Can't see anyone, but the light from the candles makes it hard to see anything across from them. The liquid courage I had drank earlier that night starts to kick in. Get a huge adrenaline boost and run into the clearing that the candles were set in. Shout who set this up, you're trespassing. No reply. Get closer, I can see now that it's a satanic pentagram with candles at each point. Adrenaline wears off, now I'm just scared shitless. Hear from beyond the candles what sounds like an older man softly, but sternly say boo. Scream at the top of my lungs, start gunning it through the cornfield. Make it to the other side, recognize this side of the circle. Start gunning it into the woods trying to find a camp. After about 15 minutes of full-on sprinting I can see the campfire. See my friend sitting in a chair holding a bottle of whiskey talking to something. I get closer. What he was talking to appeared to be a 7 feet 5 black mass of mangy fur. It points at me, my friend then looks at me. See him and the creature shake hands, then whatever it was runs into the woods. Run up to him screaming what the fuck was that and what did he do? He's passed out. I shake him to wake him up, he kind of freaks out. Ask him what the fuck is going on. He said he had been sleeping up until the point where I shook him. Explain to him what happened. We pack our shit and run out of there at full speed, leaving the tent and bags behind. Bime. Living in Nawads, Kansas. Two-story house, but it's just me and my mom. She gets the bottom floor and I get the top floor. We have an attic too but we almost never go in it. Nearest neighbor is 5 miles away, nearest grocery store is 10. Surrounded by woods and fields for as far as the eye can see. My mom is getting flown to Pizza Hut, she was a head manager. Headquarters for some weird training type shit. Won't be home for four days. Have the house all to myself. First night, I woke up at about 3 am hungry. Walk downstairs, hear buzzing. Ignore it at first until it gets louder as I get closer to the kitchen. See a dim light coming from the kitchen. I peek the corner, and the light stop turns off followed by a loud ding. Jump back, fighting off tears I'm so scared. Realize the fucking microwave was on. It finished as soon as I walked into the kitchen. Immediately run to my mom's room to grab the 12 gauge. Reach behind the door we kept it behind to grab it. Can't feel anything, open the door all the way. The fucking 12 gauge that hasn't moved in 10 plus years ig one. Suddenly, I hear steps coming up from the basement. The door to the mudroom opens, see a flashlight scan the room and then lock onto me. Start running. Pow, shotgun blast right into my back. Luckily it was birdshot. Make it to the car before he can fire another shot. Drive off to hospital, get pellets removed. The cops did a thorough search of the perimeter, but couldn't find anyone. The only thing missing was a small bag of cash my mother kept around. Getting shot at is some scary shit. The Erosas Bridge is located just outside the town of Valley Center in Kansas, United States. Over the years, it has burned down and been rebuilt. There are several versions of the tale. The first and oldest version is set in the late 19th century when settlers were traveling through the area. According to this story, a wagon train was passing through when a group of Native Americans 
then called in Jones, attacked and a settler's baby named Therosa was stolen. Her mother, grief-stricken and sick with worry, left the wagon train to search for her daughter. Legend has it that her apparition still roams the creek near the side of the bridge, her mournful voice still crying out Therosa, forever searching for her lost child, never to be seen by her again. Another version goes like this. Theorosa is a young Native American woman who has an illegitimate baby with a white settler and to hide her shame. She throws the baby into a nearby river and drowns it. Then, overwhelmed by grief, she also hurls herself into the water. In another close version, Theorosa is standing on the banks of the creek when she is stabbed in the back by the baby's father. The baby falls into the water and is carried away and Theorosa dies a short time later, only to haunt the creek, searching for the lost child. If you say, Theorosa, Theorosa, I have your child, her specter will come and get angry at you. A more modern version of the story has Theorosa as a local farm wife who has an illegitimate child with a hired hen. To hide her guilt, she throws the baby from the bridge. She jumps in after the child into the river and then returns to haunt the place. The story also maintains that those who stand on the bridge and speak aloud that they are Theorosa's child will be attacked by the specter as she rushes up from the river and tries to throw the person into the water below. Another modern version of the story goes like this. The mother and her family lived near the creek. Their next-door neighbors lived three miles east from them. The mother had three children, two sons and one daughter named Theorosa. She, her husband, and sons all had blonde hair. But her daughter had brown hair. Her husband suspects her of cheating with their neighbor and drowns Theorosa in the creek. When she asked her husband where Theorosa was, he confessed that he killed her and the mother ended up searching day after day for her baby. While searching for her baby, her husband takes the two sons and abandons her. She ended up farming and living on her own until she died of natural death. But every day, she would go back to the very same spot her husband described, down the creek at the end of the bridge. To this day, she still visits the very same spot. If you recite a chant about having her child, she will try to hurt you. Yet another modern version of the story is this. There also was a witch who lived near the creek. She conceived and bore a baby girl. She cast a spell of protection on herself and her daughter. The town people were scared and thought that if they killed her and the baby the spell would die with them. The town folk captured Theorosa and hung her over the bridge and soon after drowned the baby in the creek. To this day, if you go to the original site of the bridge on Halloween around midnight and chant, Theorosa, Theorosa, I have your baby, she will attack you. The next morning when you awake, you will have scratch marks all the way down your back. To get to the old site, the road to the new bridge comes to a curve. At the curve you walk straight through the cornfield and you will come to the creek. The new bridge and all the signs by it are covered in graffiti. The bridge is located at 109th Street North and Meridian. I posted this story some time ago on a similar thread and nobody noticed really. So I'm posting it here because I think it's creepy. Damn it. I was young at the time but I still remember it clearly, and I know I wasn't dreaming. I lived in a small town in Kansas, the sort where you never saw anyone you didn't know and there was pretty much no crime to speak of. Our yard was surrounded on three sides by woods and my bedroom window faced one of these wooden sides. My mother had her flower garden on this side of the yard, and there was a crab apple tree maybe ten yards from the window. Between that space there was nothing but bare dirt, no old farming equipment or anything of that nature. Be about six or so. Nighttime but not quite bedtime, I'd put it at about 9 p.m. This town rolls up its sidewalks at 5 p.m. We didn't live particularly close to the town proper. And nobody would have any business being in the yard. Also, raging thunderstorm. I was watching the storm as I was fascinated by the lightning and I sure as hell didn't have anything else to do. The window curtain was to my back and my nose was damn near pressed against the glass. Close enough that I couldn't see my reflection. Lightning strikes, damn close. Not quite as close as the apple tree, but definitely in the yard. As soon as the lightning strikes, I see there is a man-shaped thing in the yard. Bare feet from the window. Looking in at me. He seemed to be illuminated from within with the same bluish-purple glow of the lightning. Too frightened to move, I stared back at him for several seconds, long enough to determine it wasn't a trick of the light. Perhaps out of fear, I whispered to the thing. I hate you. From his bed my older brother grunted angrily at this comment. I turned from the window to say I wasn't talking to him. 
never looked back out the window to see if he was still there. Didn't tell anyone. It looked somewhat like the 10k volt ghost from Scooby-Doo, only smaller and blue. July 3rd, 2012. I am 11 years old. Late as fuck. Small town Ottawa, Kansas. It's 11 late at night, me and my friend. Let's call him Max headed south to get some stuff at Walmart which was on the other side of town. 2012 was when Ottawa went to shit with crackheads and murderers. Me and Max were riding my bike down the bike trail. I installed a 4-speed motor on it several weeks prior to the incident and that night would be the first time I ever used it. It was a really big bike trail. It lead to the town south of Ottawa, Princeton, and past that town too. We have quite a bit of money. Like $200 to get some goodies for Independence Day tomorrow. Mom told us to just get anything from meat, fruit, vegetables, it doesn't matter. When we were leaving 7th Street and turning south Max noticed that there were four people following us. He tells me that they've been following us for a bit and he should probably pick up speed. We didn't think about it much until we noticed they followed us clear to West 17th Street. By this time me and him started getting worried so I turned off the trail and onto the main road which was the South Princeton Circle Drive. Luckily for us it was really busy at the time because Independence Day was tomorrow. Successfully get to Walmart and load up on tons of shit. Max bought 10 bags worth of fucking teriyaki beef jerky. If you're on here you need to tone it down on the beef jerky, dude. I go to the seafood section and check out the lobster and salmon. I grabbed 6 lobsters and 6 salmon. Love buttered lobster and peppered lemon salmon. I then go to the beef section and get some beef. Go to the vegetable section. Gonna make some vegetable soup along with that. We buy some more stuff and leave the store and notice that those shitheads are on our tail. We get back on the bike trail and head back home. We pass the price chopper north of Walmart. Suddenly the other two jump out of a fucking tree branch and almost block us. I shit my pants and swerve to the east. Max somehow stayed on and I turned back on the trail and headed south from shock. Max starts fucking screaming at me to haul ass. The four people gained on us because we lost our speed from all that maneuvering. They chased us till we hit the other side of the highway on the south side of town. Realize I have the fucking motor. Tell Max to pull the rope thingy. You know those wires to turn on a push mower. Yeah those. It starts and we start picking up speed. 10 seconds later and we're going like 30 plus miles an hour down the bike trail. 5 minutes pass and we were able to lose them and we're out in the middle of fucking nowhere too. Don't know where to go, too damn scared to head back north because of those fuckers. Realized we were heading south to the next town. Princeton, my aunt lives there. Decide to drive to Princeton. Max is still freaking out and is like where are you driving, and shit like that. We reached my aunt's house and they were confused as shit. Asking us how do you two get down here late at night. Me and Max told them the entire event and what just happened. Luckily they didn't send us back home and let us stay the night. They called my mom, they asked Max if he wanted to call his parents. He responded. Hell nah. They don't know about this anyway. My mom was freaking the fuck out and started bashing on me for the whole thing. At least I'm not drunk 24-7. My face when four people were arrested the afternoon of July 4th for murder. I don't live in Ottawa anymore. Not me but my uncle. Be an uncle back in his early 20s. Southeast Kansas just north of the Oklahoma border. Living in a tiny ass town, practically a village. No bank, post office has only 70 boxes. Nothing to do except drink or fuck some dead end hoes. Halloween day. Friend calls and says he's picked up three girls they know and their OTW. Gonna visit some spooky places for Halloween. Offakai's Halloween.exe. They swing by in a shitty convertible held together with wire and duct tape. The first place a friend can think of is a rundown barn a good 30 miles from the town. The barn served as an improvised shelter. Hospital for a small Confederate detachment to tend to their wounded. Legend goes. Union soldiers found the Confederates and killed them all one by one in the middle of the night as they slept. Legend goes the barn is so haunted no one wanted it so it sits abandoned and ruined. They show up to the barn which is practically about to collapse and go inside through a gaping hole in the side. Uncle pulls out a shitty little flashlight to look around with and explore the piles of shit laying around. One of the girls lets out a little squeak and says she heard something coming form the other end of the barn. Uncle trying to be alpha says it's just a raccoon or mouse crawling around. Just as he finishes saying that a clicking sound starts from right above them. Uncle spills spaghetti and whips the flashlight up. Damn barn owl looking down at them with big black eyes clicking its beak at them and hissing. Girls all scream as the owl swoops down and flies out the window. Hour passes and nothing more to do at the barn and nothing spooky has happened. 
Girls say they want to go home. Friend convinces girls to check out another place with them before they go home. Place is a particular field on the state border where lights are seen at night. Urban legend says if you go out at the middle of the night and whistle a light will appear out in the rolling hills. Light is described as being approx 7 feet off the ground and appears several hundred yards out and floats towards you. The light is a torch of a group of Indian warriors long dead who respond to the whistle thinking they are being signaled by another warrior group to fend off lands from white. Friend decides it's a perfect place to go and see if the legend is true. Spend a good hour driving to this field on single lane backroads. Girls are beginning to complain about how long it's been and whether or not they're lost. SDFU, MP3. They arrive and know they are at the right spot based off landmarks. All get out of the car and my friend whistles long and hard into the night. All stand in silence and look out into the fields barely visible by moonlight. Uncle doesn't believe the legend so he doesn't expect anything to happen. About five minutes later my friend lets out another whistle. Time passes and nothing happens again. Girls say it's time to go as they move towards the car. At this time uncle agrees and moves around the car to get in. Right as he looks up to his friend to tell him it's time to leave he notices his friend is still and there's a faint noise in the air. Noise is barely audible and way out in the distance. Sounds like a cow making its way through a patch of mud stomping and sloshing. Suddenly there's a faint whistle all the way out and changing tune from low to high pitch. Whistle is followed by distinctive drumming. Uncle describes it as approx 1 to 2 beats a second, quiet but definitely drums. Everyone stops what they're doing and focuses hard on the noise's direction and that's when they see it. It's a dim flickering light that just crested a hill and it's coming towards them. At this time uncle notices two things. One of the girls has come up to him practically shitting herself babbling incoherently and is grabbing his arm. His friend who up to this point has been still is now shaking. Almost convulsing from fear. Light gets close enough uncle can make out the outline of a figure under the light. Holy fucking shit. Girls are going ape shit and screaming at this point trying to drag uncle in the car. Friend finally snaps out of whatever fear-induced trance he was in and literally jumps into the car. Light is now only 100 feet away as friend kicks up dirt and hauls ass. Uncle looks back to see the figure is now standing still and watching. Face just barely illuminated by the light. Speed back to town doing no less than 30 over the limit. Girls crying their eyes out. One has pissed all over herself. Uncle dropped off at his house. About to go to bed when he notices a burning pain on his arm and looks to see it's red. Bruise where the girl squeezed his arm during the encounter. Slept with all the lights on that night. Never talked to that friend again. He only told me this story once and when I tried to ask details about the figure under the light his face changed and he couldn't bring himself to describe it. A bit of backstory before going into this. The 16. Move with my mother to Kansas. End up in a small rural town about 40 miles north of the Oklahoma, Kansas border. Boring as fuck. Don't fit in with anyone. The neighbor lady, let's call her Wally, is an old German woman. Pretty based. Obviously disgusted by the degeneracy of her grandchildren, one of whom I was just a year ahead of. So, here it goes. Wally develops some sort of cancer. Stopped seeing her around the first couple of months of my senior year. Eventually I completely stopped seeing her. Her family of vultures comes around with realtor people and appraisers and shit. Storm comes around. Town tornado sirens go off. Her house was the closest with a storm shelter. Get stuff and go down there. Just myself because my stepfather was working and my mother went to the store. The door moves like someone is trying to open it but struggling. Think that it's one of the little ones or something. Open it. No one topside. Write it off as the wind. Sit back down and pull out my phone. The sounds outside of it touching down just right out of town. Scary as shit. Thank you. Lol what? And then the storm died and the siren stopped. More from me. About a month before the incident. Wake up at about 4 a.m. Sun barely coming over the horizon. Take a jog down the road while listening to some music. 98.9 The Rock FM. Nothing like good old classic rock. Make it to the mile and a half point. Start jogging back. Past my neighbor, who is also a loner corn farming friend. Me and him never got along though. He always sent me texts about how he wants to sleep with my sister. He literally saw her once during a BBQ I had a while back that he had been invited to. Half a mile to my house. Radio turns to static. Get a phone call. Pick it up. It's my neighbor, whose house I just passed by. Who was that dude running behind you? 
Figure he is bullshitting so I decide to fuck with him that's my sister bro. Don't bullshit me, that was a dude. At this point I am on edge. Ask him what the fuck, I was kidding about my sister. But now I am a bit freaked out. Look behind me, no one. The phone call cuts. And static starts playing again. Sprint like a motherfucker back to my house. Grab a gun. Sit on my porch for a good 20 minutes with a shotgun in hand. Call my neighbor back. Ask him what the person looked like. He tells me it was a tall dude wearing a bathrobe and carrying something that resembled a clock. Ask him what drugs he had been taking. He hangs up on me. Spooked the fuck out. Didn't sleep easy that night. Be me 11 or 12. Live in the ghost town of Timken, Kansas. Less than 90 people. Every once in a while we visit my cousins in Topeka. One day me and my cousin decide to get on his bikes and ride around. Ride around for about 3 or 4 hours. We find a tiny town called Stull. Neither of us heard of Stull before. We ride in and look around. Creepy people watching us through building windows. We look around the graveyard and decide to chill here for a while. People start coming out and staring at us. We go to get on our bikes and realize that his tires are missing. Nope.jpg. We start freaking out. The people are starting to walk towards us. He gets on the front of the bike I am riding and we nope the fuck out of there. We stop and switch who is biking every 30 minutes. We get back and say nothing about it. I go home and ask people about Stull. They start telling me all this shit. I freak the fuck out. Fast forward two years. Go back to Topeka. Tell my cousin. He says he needs to tell me something. He says that he sees people watching him. What the fuck dot jpeg. Goes back to Timken. Starts hallucinating and seeing people outside my windows. Moves out of state one year later. Nothing has happened since. The hallucinations have stopped but thinking about it still scares the shit out of me. In the small town of Stull, Kansas, there once stood an old one-room chapel on top of a hill, surrounded by graves. Beside the church was a cellar that was very difficult to find, as its doors had grass grown upon them. In front of the church was a great tree that was always bare. None of the town's members could recall ever having seen a leaf upon its branches. In the town's earliest years, there were several farming families that lived there. The minister's daughter had fallen madly in love with a boy from nearby, but had her heart broken when that young man impregnated a certain flirtatious town's girl. The two were married, and all the while the reverend's daughter saw them, happy together, and her hatred brewed until after nine months of painful endurance, that despise boiled over. Shortly after the young couple's child was born the minister's daughter went to their house. They greeted her cheerfully but noticed, all too late, how she eyed the child blood thirstily. She slit the throats of those two who'd made her life so miserable and then dragged their bodies, along with the newborn child, up the hill to the church. She put the bodies in the cellar and left the baby there, between their bodies, to starve to death. She locked the cellar shut and hung herself on the tree in front of the church. The bodies in the cellar were not found for three weeks. From that day on leaves never grew on that tree. If you walk the graveyard late at night you can just hear the sound of a baby's chilling cry. The townspeople burnt down the tree many years ago, in the hopes of putting the minister's daughter's spirit to rest. And more recently the church collapsed onto itself, burying the already difficult to find cellar. Many have looked for its doors, but the few who have found them and ventured beneath its depths have seldom returned, with the exception of a few who came back to the sunlight after three weeks beneath starved nearly to death and covered in blood that was not their own. Sinkhole Sam is a worm-like creature said to inhabit a portion of Inman Lake in Kansas known as the Sinkhole. It is also known as the Fuppenjerkel, though there's no solid explanation of what that might have meant. Before America was colonized by Europeans, Kansas was covered in small streams, lakes and rivers but since then has been blocked up and dried only leaving a few natural lakes and streams. Locals theorize that Sam is actually a prehistoric creature that lived in flooded underground caverns and it somehow led into the lake. The first known account of the beast came from two men fishing at the sinkhole when they saw the creature. 
Following this event, Albert Neufeld and George Reger also claimed to have seen the creature, claiming that it was approximately 15 feet in length and as round as an automobile tire. The Brownsville Herald, 1953 Sighting of the creature have stopped over the years, leaving us to wonder if the creature died or has gone back into the cavern from whence it came. The Salina Journal, November 23, 1952 A similar creature has been reported about 50 miles south of Inman at the Kingman State Lake. The State Lake, while not a naturally occurring lake, was formed from a naturally occurring marsh and is located next to the Nineska River. Both in the early 1900s and in the late 1960s, several accounts of a large snake were reported. Eyewitness accounts of this snake's size vary. Some have said that it is the size of a large python, and others have said that its girth is so large that even a tractor could not run over it. In the late 60s a large search for this large snake was conducted, but no snake other than the known native species were found. This creature has never been given a proper name. However, some believe this creature to be the same creature or of the same species as Sinkhole Sam. Over time, reports of such a snake have greatly diminished. However, other cryptids such as Mothman, Bigfoot, and a mysterious figure in a trench coat have also been reported around the Kingman State Lake. The Blue Albino Woman is a unique woman that is located in Topeka, Kansas. She can be mostly seen at the Rochester Cemetery at night. She is a mysterious person. Sometimes, she can be seen roaming around the streets of Topeka. From afar, she just looks like a harmless and frail elderly lady, but the closer she gets to you, the more you notice her unique features. Many people who've encountered this woman have noticed that she is not like most people. She hardly utters a word, but that only makes her seem even more interesting. She has a pale pigment, glowing skin, light eyes, white teeth, and long white hair. Many people who dare visit the Rochester Cemetery at nighttime usually encounter her. People often run off. Some people who don't make it because they're scared of the dark, say that the woman will say boo, and the scary people run off. She's even been seen arising from the graveyard ground to scare the people off, because it's funny to see the look on their face. She's even seen once in a while out in public like stores, but it's on very rare occasions. Supposedly, the blue albino woman was once a somewhat normal and living person. It's just that she was albino, she had a strange and unique physical appearance. She'd easily stand out in the crowd. She was often teased and tormented about her looks. A group of men thought for sure she was a witch, so they dug out a place for her, shoved her in there, and buried her alive. Many people believe her horrible death is the main reason why the woman is so angry and violent with people. She can never find rest or peace, she is on a revengeful limbo. According to legend, the golden bear was a large golden Ursus arctos. Members of the Ursus arctos, brown bear, species can reach masses of 130 to 700 kilograms, 290 to 1,540 pounds. The grizzly bear, Ursus arctos horribilis, and the Kodiak bear are North American subspecies of the brown bear. A great golden bear was reported in the area of Turner, Kansas. According to John Gardiner in 1831, it was feared and admired by the local Indian population. The bear lived south of the river in the hills west of the Methodist Mission. According to legend, it was the largest bear that any of the natives had ever seen. It would raid the settlements of the area folks and feasted on the animals owned by the local population, the Shawnee tribe. Many of the Indians wanted to kill the bear for the pride of such a feat and the capture of its hide, the fur was most sought after. The golden bear was seen several times by the ferry crew on the old Grinter ferry during the 1830s and 1840s. Both the Shawnee and the Wyandotte gathered a hunting party, but were unsuccessful in tracking the bear down. The golden bear became the mascot for Turner High School and was adopted by the community in 1886. Two members of the community, Warren Hewitt and Jewel Gaynett, submitted the icon and it won the majority of support in a contest. Reportedly, the two youths had heard of the bear from stories told by their grandparents. This icon is based on legends of that golden bear. Western New England College adopted the golden bear as its mascot in the early 1950s. 
Sierra Pacific High School in Hanford, California adopted the Golden Bear as its mascot when it opened in 2009. Since the 1950s in Hutchinson, Kansas, hikers in the Sand Hills have been warned against wandering from the trails or they might find themselves captured by the Hamburger Man. Who is the Hamburger Man? I'm so glad you asked. The deformed man is said to live in a shack somewhere in the woods of Sand Hill State Park. He stalks the area for hikers who wander from the trail where he kills them using either a long, curved knife or a hook and takes them back to his cabin. There, he grinds their bodies into hamburger meat. Locals can't seem to agree whether this is Slash was a living man who was disfigured in some way or a ghost, though if the legends have been around since the 1950s, it's highly likely Mr. Hamburger Man has passed on. Still, the urban legend survives and thrives and will most likely go one for generations to come. Atchison, Kansas, the Sally House, this house in Atchison, in northeast Kansas, haunted by the ghost of a young girl named Sally, was popular amongst ghost hunters in the 90s for its heavily documented paranormal activity. Men who visit the house have been the main victims of her attacks, as the rumor of the house says that Sally died at the hands of a male doctor who used the house as his office. Ghost scratches, flickering lights, rearranged furniture and drops in temperature have all been accounted by visitors. Clark County, Kansas, St. Jacob's Well, the sinkhole nicknamed St. Jacob's Well, resides in the Big Basin Prairie Reserve, about a half hour's drive from Dodge City. The sinkhole, formed by centuries of erosion, is believed to be bottomless. According to rumors, dozens of visitors have lowered rope into the e-well to try to find the bottom, all to no avail. Those unfortunate few who strayed too close and fell into the hole have never been found. Bel Air, Kansas, Bel Air Water Tower, the highly visible Bel Air Water Tower is rumored to be the site of a tragic construction accident. During construction, a worker allegedly fell into the middle of the tower. When the rest of the crew discovered his body, they decided to continue construction, leaving the body inside. It's rumored that the ghost of the worker now haunts the tower and can be heard rapping on the walls, trying to get out. Abilene, Kansas was about 30 miles away from Junction City, Kansas, which was a polite way of saying it was in the absolute and total middle of nowhere. It was, however, a nice nowhere. A photogenic nowhere. Trains tracks ambled through the downtown. Regional chain restaurants had drive through lanes. Bright white churches shared space next to banks, framed and bordered by the relatively few traffic lights. When the nighttime came, though, it added a filter to the architecture. Something more sinister, which fit into the town's secondary, shadowy narrative about itself. Abilene was two towns and always had been. The quaint Americana of the daytime, and the deep strange abyss of its night. If you were to ask someone, and you shouldn't, and they were to talk about it. Which they wouldn't, they would say whatever it was that made that place the way it was like that before the white people ever got there. That the Wichita wouldn't live in that spot because of the wrongness there. Shit, it wasn't even humans that wouldn't live there. All kinds of rumors murmured that even animals hadn't lived there. The whole circumference of the town was trackless and untouched prairie under endless skies. But the town got built anyway. This was back when the trails to the west came through that part of the country. Abilene became a stopping point first, then a sort of town. Over time it grew up and then, like most towns out there, it faded out as the trail dwindled. Abilene didn't vanish as some places did, however. Those ghost towns of under a hundred people surrounded by a thousand empty buildings. No, Abilene held on, small and quaint and strange. There were rumors in the town, strange incidents that were difficult to easily explain. Things about missing people, unexplained tracks and dirt, buildings that were empty in daytime, but somehow full at night, cars that no one recognized driving slowly through almost empty streets. The familiar charm of the streets would develop an alien edge after sunset. The trees that looked so alive and beautiful in the day became long collections of wet green ashy shadows, present and pressing against the edges of the evening. That night, Tracy Mellies was the only person on the street. That wasn't unusual. Tracy was almost always alone and she always walked everywhere. This night she was down off of South Brady, where the manufacturing plant was. During the day, trucks went in and out to the factory, down the wide roads and past the small, 
fenced-in homes, with deliveries and exhaust smoke. It was night now though, and the trucks with their deliveries were long gone. It was colder that night than usual. It had dipped below freezing the past two nights and was well on its way to making it a third. Footsteps sound strange at night. Tracy was used to it, the way they echo farther, emptier. Tracy worked at the diner downtown. Open almost all night, the neon sign winked at potential customers. And it was true. Monday to Friday, her shift ended when the doors locked, which was always a little after the kitchen closed at 3 a.m. The diner wasn't a bad job, she had been working there or places like there most of her life and in some ways it was a little worse than the others and in others ways it was a whole hell of a lot better. Sometimes things weren't so good as just not that bad. The telephone poles that lined the street made shadows in the minimal streetlight. Stars glittered in the sky like mirrors do in the street after car wrecks. Her breath was white cumulus clouds. She always walked home alone. She didn't really talk to her kids that much, but if she did, and if they had a halfway normal relationship, they would say things to her about that decision. Things like, Mom, you can't walk home alone in the middle of the night. With tips. By yourself. Who knows what is going to happen to you. Footsteps sound strange when it's empty, but if you're so used to the way they sound, you may not notice when they sound suddenly different. Because you might not pay attention to things like that. Because you might be so used to being alone, you might not notice when you aren't. Because footsteps in the night sound different when they are more than one person, walking quietly, behind someone else. Tracy didn't notice things like that, just like she didn't have a normal relationship with her kids. Things hadn't gone as she wanted. She had a history of bad boyfriends and bad decisions and all the things she had done or not done bled into her kids. Both of them were sons. One was in jail. One wasn't currently in jail but usually was. More than likely, he was probably doing something to go back in there right now. Sometimes she was mad at them. Sometimes she was mad at her for doing that to them. But most of the time, she walked home by herself and no one told her she was being an idiot. Backlit by moonlight, the manufacturing plant splashed along, devouring shadow on the street. Out past the building loomed the prairie, all wild grass and long and empty. She turned right off the street and began to walk down the long winding path in between the two sections of houses. She was pretty close to her home at this point. She had been staying in an old building that had been cut up into rental units. She paid $450 a month for it. Somewhere far off, a dog was barking. Behind her, if she had looked, she'd have seen the two figures in white, walking 20 feet behind her, but she didn't. It hadn't been a bad night for tips, even if the diner had been dead. She couldn't wait to get home, the older she got, the longer these walks felt. At home she'd have a beer, watch the sun come up, turn the long Kansas landscape into a well-lit picture card. She didn't have to work tomorrow night, which was nice. She thought about maybe going grocery shopping. She thought about what she was out of in the house, what she needed more of. When the two figures got close enough, they stopped being quiet and instead simply moved quickly. One rushed behind her and grabbed her mouth with strangely smooth hands. She tried to scream, but realized the hand swallowed the piercing nature, letting only a frantic mumble come from her mouth. The other was in front of her. She was struck by his clothes, the ivory paints, the bleached shirts, the colorless shoes. His face was alabaster too, and expressionless. She didn't realize it was just a mask. Sinner, you have been chosen. She heard him say, his voice was strange sounding, like something was wrong with his tongue. Be grateful, you are a witness now. He grabbed her cheeks, opening her lips, and pulled her forward. The hand covering her mouth let go, as she tried to scream, the white man kissed her. His tongue was in her mouth. His tongue was moving in her mouth, but not like a tongue. Like an arm, a fist. It grabbed her tongue and twisted, she felt something terrible happening. Something that hurt. There was a noise around her. Blood was coming out of her lips, down her chin, soaking her uniform and she could hear a noise around her. She could almost feel the noise, like there was something coming. Something big. God loves his children. You are his witness tonight. Praise God. The scream she tried to have was dead inside of her. She saw something rising, twisting, wet and old from the fields next to the road. There were dogs barking everywhere it sounded like. Choirs of schnauzers, rottweilers, collies, all high-pitched and vibrating as she watched it appear. It was more than old. 
It was eternal. Inside of her mouth, the stump that had been tongue fluttered as she tried to say a prayer. Next to her, the white man spat blood out into the ground, red and sacrificial. She saw him chew and swallow the rest of her tongue as the thing she couldn't comprehend as being real. As existing, rose up, up, up against the star-filled prairie sky. In America, 2,300 people go missing every day. That night, Tracy was one of them. Parsons, Army Ammunition Plant, an explosion in the late 1980s killed two workers, a man and a woman, and closed the plant for more than two years. When work resumed in 1990, just in time for the Persian Gulf War, part of the building was closed. To prevent sympathetic detonation in case of an accident, work areas were located several hundred yards apart, connected by ramshackle, unpainted, wasp-infested wooden ramps. Inspectors, supervisors, and parts managers rode old-fashioned bicycles with wire handlebar baskets between areas. They used thumb-operated bicycle bells to alert other bikers and pedestrians before crossing an intersection or entering an adjoining hallway. As production of the cluster bombs continued, with 202 bombs tucked inside each one, rumors spread that the workers killed by a single exploding bomblet was haunting the closed area of the plant. Only two of the employees who survived the explosion returned to the plant, but they each began to have nightmares about their former co-worker, one was being chased through the dark, wooden ramps by the woman, whose face was destroyed in the blast by flying shrapnel. The other survivor was plagued by visions of a male co-worker being vaporized from the waist up by the explosion, his legs, shielded by the thick steel work table, beginning to turn and run without its upper body. In the dreams, they kept running. Finally, one night two inspectors and a parts manager decided to explore the closed ramp. There were no lights in the area, and the workers hadn't thought to bring a flashlight. Still, they crept ahead into the dark. About 100 feet or so up the hall, the air cooled noticeably. The men walked a few feet further until, from around a bend ahead of them, they heard it, a metallic ringing. A bicycle bell rang twice in the pitch black, abandoned hall. Then, after a pause, twice more. The men, already nervous because of the dark and cold, fled back down the ramp to the light. After catching their breath, they agreed they had heard a bicycle bell, precisely the type bell used by the company's supervisors, inspectors, etc. For transportation in the labyrinthine plant. They agreed that the sound had come from ahead of them, not behind, and they agreed it wasn't likely anyone could have been in the ramp ahead of them with a bicycle. Alma, Alma Cemetery, the Alma Cemetery is haunted for two reasons. One is the people who are buried there and refuse to leave. Some pictures have been taken during the night up there. It's the best time. The pictures were unbelievable, there were orbs and mist figures in the pictures. Reason two is the legend of the devil's chair. The story is that in the 1800s a real old mean farmer owned the land that is now the cemetery. About that same time Alma was being built. Town officials had been trying to get him to sell his land so they could use it for the new town cemetery. But he kept refusing to sell it. One day while at his well getting water someone came up from behind him and pushed him into the well. Then about a week later the town officials come out to the farm to try and to get him to sell again. And one of them noticed a smell from the well. The sheriff said it was nothing and ordered for the well to be boarded and locked and that no one is supposed to talk about it. So the farmer's land became the town cemetery. Then in the 1980s some teens decided to go out there and see if they could see the ghost of the old man. One of the teens dared another to sit on top of the closed well. The teen did as he was dared, but suddenly the group heard a sound behind them and turned to see what it was and there was nothing there. So when they turned around to see if their friend was still sitting there. But he wasn't. Thinking that it was a joke he was playing they left and figured they'd see him tomorrow. But the teen was never seen again. Over the years there have been other stories of people sitting on the devil's chair and never being seen again. Some people say that it's the farmer reaching through the now old rotted broken boards and getting revenge on the town that took his land away from him. People call it the devil's chair because the man was evil when he was alive and is still evil after death. Alma, Wabansi High School, Wabansi High School is the haunted by past students and teachers. 
most of the student groups are those of students who never got to graduate from high school because they died while attending it. Teachers and even students have experienced strange things, which occur mostly on the third floor of the building. Things usually occur when someone is on the floor alone. One time the junior, senior class English teacher was alone in her classroom grading paper. Her door is right across the hall for the school's auditorium and she noticed that the lights in the auditorium were flickering on and off and there were voices coming from it. She thought that it was some students that had stayed in the building and were goofing off. So she went to check it but the door was locked and the kept flickering. So she went back to her classroom and got her key. As soon as she unlocked and opened the door the lights and the voices stopped. So she peeked inside but saw nothing. As she walked out she was stunned at what she saw, every single locker on the floor was wide open, even the ones that had padlocks on them. She slowly closed the auditorium door and locked it and as she was locking it all the locker doors slammed shut. She was so scared that she left the high school without locking her classroom door. Another time the same teacher was again grading papers by herself in her classroom. She suddenly heard music coming from the auditorium, so she grabbed her key, went to the door, unlocked it and opened it. She almost passed out at what she saw, she saw a ghostly looking lady playing an instrument. The figure was of a teacher who used to teach band at the high school, she had died a few years ago of cancer. So when you walk the third floor hall of Wabansi High School alone beware of what you might encounter. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.